It's a convoluted kind of uh, complex argument that Freud made, and I have a complex argument about the argument Freud in turn made, and I'm worried that I'll not be able to be clear. I hope I am. But what I'm, the story I'm about to tell you is incredible, I'm telling you now, okay? And it, if I succeed in making it clear, and if I'm right in what I'm saying, it exposes what is generally considered to be one of Freud's greatest case studies and clinical theoretical triumphs of his long career. It exposes it as a terribly destructive set of events in which he harmed his patient in the most horrendous way, and it, but in a way that was lost even on the patient himself what had happened. So that's a, pre, that's a kind of preview of what I'm going to say. I'm going, I'm going to tell you Freud's story. I'm going to summarize it, condense it, but try to be faithful to it. And then I'm going to reinterpret it as I understand it after spending decades studying this case among many others. I've studied Freud inside and out for decades and decades. It's the way it is. It's what you have to do. Freud is not to be uh, neglected. I say this in personality a lot. I don't know if I've said it in here yet or not, but I'll say it now. Um, when you run across people that tell you that Freud is dead and we've all gone beyond Freud and no one takes that seriously anymore, just slap that person's face. Just slap them. Just slap them. Stand up and say, excuse me, but whap, and walk away before they hit you back or something like that. They don't know what they're talking about. Freud was an incomparable genius. He was wrong in a thousand ways, but his wrongness was always incredibly productive because then it gives the chance to be right where he was wrong. He raised the questions, he defined the field. He always had his finger on something profound, even if he had it backwards and upside down. Today's an example of that, as you'll see, I hope, if I can make it clear. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. Let's go to the case, okay? Before I can get to the case, let me go back to my abstraction, though. What's the point of my even telling you this? It's to give an Ill a concrete example of something. Freud, in really important respects, was anti-phenomenological. That's, that's, that's what my argument is. That he turned away from the complexity, the intricacy, the richness of conscious, subjective experience as he searched for what people were blocking out of awareness, looking for what was repressed, what was dissociated, what was hidden away, what was disguised, concealed, masked. That, that was Freud's obsession. That was his genius, to find areas of, of people's lives where that was taking place. But he universalized that into a kind of general approach to all people, so that when he listened to a dream or looked at a, a symptom that developed in a person's life, He's searching for what's hidden inside of it, what the person himself or herself is hiding, hiding there that needs to be exposed, often accompanied by great pain. And the purpose of the hiding is to prevent that pain. That's, that's kind of Freud for you. Phenomenology doesn't have that attitude. Phenomenology tends to, I said this before, but I'll just repeat it. I hope it's not too boring to keep repeating this. Um, tends to trust what is manifest, what is given to us as an expression, a revelation. It can be difficult to figure out what it means because pe people speak in indirect metaphors and symbols all the time. And so you have to catch on to what those symbols are. But the phenomenologist tends to assume that people, for the most part, are trying to express who they are, always. On the other hand, it sounds contradictory, Phenomenologist knows that there are special conditions in human life where people have to hide from themselves who they are. They can't stand to face certain truths about themselves, certain truths about their history or about the, the people who took care of them in their histories, and so they disguise and hide and distort and conceal. So there is that. That's a theme that might appear in human life. But it's not the universal, all-pervading theme of all lives. Freud tends toward the latter to see all of us as liars to ourselves and liars to each other. And so psychoanalytic truth is a matter of stripping away those lies and facing those painful truths. Phenomenology is not, knows the people, some people are liars. Maybe all of us lie at a certain point to ourselves and to others. But it's not a dominant, pervasive, generalized, universal theme. That's sort of, so it's a difference of emphasis there, but it's very profound. Uh, anyway, 
back, so my purpose in telling you the Wolfman is to give a concrete example of how Freud looked at somebody's conscious experience and then interpreted it as hiding certain things that needed to be faced and then to contrast with that a phenomenological approach to the thing which is much simpler and easier. We'll, you'll see as we go. Let's see if I can get into it. Hope I can tell you the whole story today. We'll see. This lecture might overlap into the next one. We'll, we will find out. Blah, blah, blah. The dream, the dream. The patient, the patient. Let me start with the patient's initial symptom. The dream is not the symptom. Picture a young man. Let us say he was 26 years old. That's roughly it. He's mid-20s anyway when he comes to Freud. This is 1914 or something. It's, it's in that range of time. Uh, Freud is in his glory. His, his mind is on fire. He's written an interpretation of dreams. He's laid out all kind of other theories. But he's still pretty young, so he's going strong, and he gets this patient. What is the patient suffering about? What does the patient bring to Freud? I mentioned it last time, but I'm going to, or I had it on the board, but I'll say it a little bit more elaborately now. Uh, the patient was suffering with a very specific experience that had basically destroyed the quality of his life and made him want to die. What was it? It was a feeling the patient had, difficult to express in words, here's the patient's words for it, that there was an invisible veil over his body that separated him from the outside world. It was a feeling of disconnection, as if there were like a barrier no one could see, he couldn't see it either but a sense of distance from surroundings, other people, even the physical environment, okay? Uh, the word that is sometimes used for that today, it's a phenomenological word, is estrangement. I've written it on the board there. The feeling of being a complete and total stranger to one's surroundings, not belonging where you are. Like right now, here you got, you guys are there and I'm here. I, there's no invisible veil. I feel real connected to you. I feel distinct from you. I don't feel I'm turning into you. I'm not like Anna. I turn into whoever I am. Are you George? Are you the students? Students George? Students George? I don't have anything like that. Okay? This is, there's a steady uh, differentiation and separation, a stability of my identity, your identity, and my experience. But I also feel we're in the same space. We're sharing, we're sharing a, a classroom. I'm talking, you're listening. Some of you might not be listening, might fall asleep. Okay, sorry, but that's, that's fine too. Do it. Sleep. If you need to sleep, sleep away. I don't care. I have a colleague in my department that throws, throws erasers at people who sleep. I think he's an asshole. And I told him so <laughs> for doing that. The person needs to sleep. How do you know they're not going to have a car accident because they didn't get to sleep in your class? Anyway, I tell them, they, fuck you, George. <laughs> this, this, is, this is a little sideline. I just trail off onto these tangents for no good reason at all. But here we are. I, I won't tell you that it was Dan Ogilvy that said that. that I, it might have been him. It might have been. Maybe you've had an eraser thrown at you in his classes. Anyway, I don't. You do not throw erasers at people. You never, never do that. Anyway, anyway, anyway. We're here together. Like, I feel connected to you. Not one with you, not merged with you. Screw that. I'm George, you're you. But this guy's talking about something else. This is a disturbance of, in self world experience, just as profound as melting into people. It's a feeling of radical disconnection, like in being in an infinite remove from other people altogether. And normally we don't have this as an experience in our lives. And fortunately, fortunately for most of us, we don't have to have it. But it makes you want to die, it's so bad. It's like, the, it's like there's an invisible veil, a shield, no one can see, but it just puts you at a, at a, at a limitless remove, a place of complete and total disconnection. Now, a wonderful book about this experience is Sylvia Plath's brilliant novel, the Bell Jar. Maybe if you're a literature student, you know Sylvia Plath's writings. I worship the ground that woman walked upon past tense because she killed herself. Why did she do that? Because she had this experience, is why, in, put it in simplest terms. The Bell Jar is a novel about a young woman, but it is completely auto autobiographical. It's like, uh, I never promised you a rose garden. It's about a young woman, but it's, it's the author's own experience. And her picture was there's an invisible bell jar that somebody placed down upon her body and that cut her off. It's the invisible veil of the wolfman. It's the same thing exactly. And the, the book, The Bell Jar, 
was kind of the story of her struggle with that experience, among others. And there were a bunch of others, and all kind of things happened to her. And she tried psychotherapy, and they gave her shock therapy, and all kind of darn things. But what finally happened at the end of the story, if you follow it, and then if you know her biography, is that um, the bell jar kept coming back. And finally, she couldn't stand it any longer. So she just turned the gas on in her oven and put her head in there and finished the job. That was the end of that. I'm convinced that Sylvia Plath killed herself because of the bell jar, the invisible veil. And um, I had a student who did an honors thesis on Sylvia Plath's life and death. It made a lot of sense out of the whole thing. I don't especially feel like going into her life story and the struggle with her mother and with her mother's self-centered narcissism, which is a big key to it. <coughs> Although it overlaps with the story of the Wolfman, hopefully as you'll see as I tell it, okay? So the Wolfman is not just having a little bit of an odd feeling. You can kind of like, when he says there's a there's an invisible veil separating him from the world, this is not a, you know, I feel a little bit out of sorts, like kind of not connected to my surroundings. I can handle it, he can't handle it. It's devastating. It makes you not want to live. That's what he brought to Freud. He had tried all kind of other methods. He'd gone to every doctor he could find. He'd gone for special baths and hot springs and salts and everything. Nothing worked. He finally tried psychoanalysis. Freud took him in. Okay. And I'm just going to, I'm going to say a bunch of things that are almost like sound bites, and I'm hoping that in your mind you can hold on to them and let them kind of assemble into a structure as we go. But Freud has almost nothing at all to say about the invisible veil, bell jar feeling that the Wolfman <coughs> brought to him. And uh, he looked upon it, as you'll see, as a kind of disguise, an indirect symbol of all kinds of unconscious traumas that would happen to this patient. A phenomenologist, on the other hand, would be alarmed and focused very much upon this as the real problem this person has. This person does not feel he's part of his own world. This is a disaster that can destroy life. So uh, without knowing for sure what all I would say about it or how I would explore it, my interest would be intensely focused on the estrangement feeling itself. I would want to know, for example, its entire history I were the Wolfman's therapist. When is the first time this happened? Tell me every instance you can remember of it. What does it feel like? What are all of its nuances and complexities? Are there things that exacerbate it, things that reduce it? And then I would try to make a story, make an interpretation, make an understanding out of what had happened in this life to make him feel at such a distant remove. Because phenomenology assumes every experience we have ha has a context that it belongs to. And if we can find that context, we'll make sense of what this experience is. And if we do that, we might begin to make a difference to what this patient is then suffering with. Freud did none of that. He did an indirect, symbolic interpretation of it that I'll tell you about as we go. So uh, Freud, uh, Freud, the title of Freud's paper, I think, is Notes Upon a Case of Obsessional Neurosis. Don't worry about the, the language there, except I would just say one thing about it. Uh, by classifying this patient as a, in a case of neurosis, some mental illnesses are sometimes divided into two grand categories, neuroses and psychoses. Neuroses are less disturbed. A person can be all mixed up and full of conflict and trapped and paralyzed in his or her life, but a psychosis is where the bottom falls out and you no longer even know what is real and unreal. So Freud wanted to classify this patient as a lesser degree of disturbance. As the case develops, and I will tell you the story, you'll see that he belongs in the latter category, not the former. He, he became quite dramatically psychotic after Freud's treatment. We'll talk about that as we go. So I, I see Freud as having underestimated the degree of disturbance that was existing for this patient. This is a little bit of a preview again. You'll see as we go. Um, in Freud's uh, study, he decided to make the recurrent dream of the patient the centerpiece of the analysis. If he could understand the dream, thought Freud and said Freud in his essay, then he could understand the patient. And the patient, on the other hand, what chances there were of a successful recovery from what he was struggling with depended upon the patient also understanding this dream. What was the dream? Well, I've got the picture on the board again, just a little bit even more schematic than last time. Not too far from what the patient produced for Freud, though. And then it's reproduced in Freud's case study of, the, of, this, of this guy. 
Um, let me go over it again. I said it last time, but it's just real brief. This is a dream that happened dozens, probably hundreds of times in this person's life, always pretty much exactly the same. Um, the patient, beginning at age four, perhaps three, it's hard to know when it began exactly, but it's in that range. It's, it's the middle of early childhood. Awaken, or does it, he's lying in his bed, and the window shades suddenly go up. So he's looking out into a, a nighttime scene. It's winter, and there's a tree outside the bedroom that he's lying in. And, in, and there are no leaves on the tree, it being winter, it's cold. And in the tree are perched four, five or six pure white wolves, all looking down, staring directly at the boy. That's all there is to the dream, except for the, 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 what happens in the dream is the, the window goes up, the wolves are there, he sees them, and then there's an escalating terror, and he generally wakes up probably screaming in fear. And it's not even said in the text of the dream that Freud reports to us what he's afraid of, but it's evident what it is. The wolves are going to get him. They'll pounce in the window, and he'll be ripped to shreds and devoured. That's what it is. So the dream on its face is a dream of uh, a, a terror, extreme endangerment, and a terror of complete and total self-destruction. That's what it is. Okay. That's the manifest content of the dream, as Freud would think about it. Freud wants to find out what the secret inner meaning of this dream is, what's concealed there. Now, I'm kind of, I'm so, as I'm talking about this, I'm going to jump back and forth between a phenomenological approach and a Freudian approach, as I understand Freud and as I recount what he tried to do with this. If I hear a dream like that, like some, one of my patients comes, and I've had many patients who had such dreams, not something exactly this, but other ones that are more or less parallel, that show recurring pictures of them either in danger of being completely destroyed or even actually being completely destroyed again and again and again all through childhood. I take it very literally in a way. The, the meta, there's going to be metaphors there. Like if, if the patient, for example, like if you were in that personality class, you heard me tell about a woman who dreamed that dreamed recurrently hundreds of times, just like the wolfman, that when she's walking in the hallway of her, of her family's house, a giant black spider suddenly reaches out from the basement room and draws her in there and eats her alive. That, that's kind of like the, the uh, wolfman's dream. It's the wolves, not the spider. And they don't jump in and get him, but they're on the edge of doing it when he wakes up. So it's pretty much the same kind of thing. And as a phenomenologist, I say this is a, chi a child who would have a dream like this recurrently is dealing with a terror of complete and total self-destruction that is relentlessly present in his childhood. Freud doesn't go there. He thinks it's an indirect, it's the use of this as a symbol of something very, very different and very indirect. So let's, let, so let me see if I can give you an accounting of his sequence. And this is going to be so weird, you're hardly going to believe what I'm going to tell you Freud thought. You're going to say, that's bullshit that Freud thought that. I agree with you. Yet, at the same time, I disagree with you profoundly. This is why, this is why this lecture is very confusing. Freud was completely wrong about this case. He had it upside down and backwards, except for one thing. He had it exactly right, but upside down and backwards. So if you just know that. And if I, can con if I can convey that to you, I will have succeeded in what I have to tell you. OK. Let's first of all just take the surface of what he has to say. So Freud says, well, what in the world are we going to do with this dream? How does a Freudian approach? You've got this 26-year-old guy suffering with this horrible veil feeling. Uh, but he's got this recurrent dream. Freud thinks the dream is the key to the neurosis, the key to the history, the key to what happened to this guy. Let's interpret the dream. How, does, how do Freudians go about it? He does it like this. Let's collect the associations to the dream. Freudian method of dream analysis is that uh, you have a dream, and then the analyst asks the patient, well, tell me what comes to mind in relation to each of the images of the dream that you remember. And so you collect a whole set of thought trains that are kind of radiating off from the dream that you've had, those provide clues to the analyst and to the patient as to what the dream might mean, what its concealed inner content might concern. That's the idea. So he asked the patient to do that, and the patient came up with the following. He remembered a fairy tale. So imagine the 26-year-old associating to Freud's request about the dream, 
and remember the following well I thought, what is it you what, what, what comes to mind? Well I remember a fairy tale that I used to be told as a child. It's a simple little structure. Freud said, What is that? The patient said, Well, it was this this is a boring fairy tale, not nearly as good as even Red Riding Hood, it's so boring, but here it is. Uh, there was a woodsman in the woods, and he wanted to chop some wood to make fire for his family or something. And he's out there chopping wood, and all of a sudden, a pack of wild wolves approaches him, and he freaks out. He climbed a tree, got way up high in the tree, and the wolves are barking and yelling, you know, growling and whatever, but they can't climb the tree to get him. And the woodsman's got the axe in his hand. The patient is telling Freud this. Are you guys with me so far? Imagine this is, this is, these are the patient's words to Freud. Freud says, yes, yes, and what more, what more? The patient says, well, what happened then? Well, the woodsman was trapped up there. The wolves wouldn't leave him alone. If he goes down, he's going to be eaten alive. It's no good, no good to do that. So the woodsman finally leans over the edge of the branches and shouts at the wolves, Get the hell out of here, wolves. And if you don't, do you know what's going to happen to you? I'm coming down there with my axe. I'm going to chop off your tails. And the wolves all yip, 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 run away, run away, run away, run away. That's it. Real boring, stupid fairy tale. But that's it. Nevertheless, it's the wolfman's fairy tale that he remembered. Now, do you know what Freudians do with an image like the idea of chopping off an animal's tail? You guys know enough about Freudian theory and Freudian imagery and so on? A cardinal principle elaborated by this time in Freud's development about dream interpretation is there are certain images that always mean the same thing. And the anatomical object that we call a tail on any animal is a phallic symbol. It's a symbol of the male genital organ, always, invariably, universally. And so the, so the dream association has a picture of castration right almost on its surface. It's not quite on its surface because it's hidden in the symbol of the tail. But that's what this is. So Freud was alerted to the, to, the, to the presence in the emotional texture of the underlying meaning of this dream, of a castration theme. That's, that's what he does with it. So he said, whatever this dream is about, it concerns the danger of castration, the anxiety of castration, having one's penis chopped off now, if you, if you haven't studied Freud, you don't know this, but he considered the fear of castration to be a pivotal feature of every male's development of his or, his or her personality. It's actually a pivotal feature of a female personality, too, except she's past tense. She considers herself castrated since she has no penis. But this, is, this is Freud for you, that he thought in those terms. So that's element number one in Freud's unfolding interpretation of this dream. So he's alerted to the fact by the association that castration imagery is involved here. Probably the anxiety of the dream must then be somehow a fear of being castrated, of having one's penis chopped off. That's his hypothesis that he's working on. The dream itself on the surface is a fear of being attacked by the wolves. But dreams don't mean what they show. This is, this is Freud for you. They, they, they conceal something else. We have to find what they conceal. This is not phenomenology. I think dreams tend to show what we, uh, they show what they are. On the other hand, this, this is why it's so confusing and it's hard for me to give this lecture. Some dreams do conceal what they are about because people sometimes need to conceal from themselves what they're dealing with and that will show up in dreams. So yes, sometimes Freud is right, but a lot of times maybe not. Anyway, so look, what's the rest of the argument? So Freud got on the, on the track then. Let's try to figure out what happened to this man. This dream has been happening since early childhood. So something must have happened in his early life that got it started. And whatever it is that happened was a, um, involved a stirring up of a fear of castration. What could it have been? Freud formed the hypothesis that there was some traumatic experience this child underwent before the dream began, obviously, that then was encoded in the dream and its repetitions later. What, what could this traumatic experience have been, and when would it have occurred? Freud hypothesized it occurred when the child was two, maybe even one and a half years old, lost to memory, repressed, buried completely. But Freud thought that the psychoanalysis of this patient required unearthing what this might have been and figuring it all out. So he, so he sets forth on a, on a journey to figure it out, and that's his, his essay about the patient, is presents this argument. And I'm going to summarize it for you, 
This is going to sound preposterous, but I promise you it's faithful to Freud's logic, if you want to call this logic. Okay, it goes like this. Um, the dream association to the, uh, to the wolves and the woodsmen have the woodsmen in the tree and the, the wolves down below, right? That's pretty straightforward, but the dream has the wolves in the tree and the child down below. So there's there's a physical kind of lo relocation and reversal of who's in the tree and who's below, who's, above, who's up and who's below, in, 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 in the uh, contrast between the association to the dream that Freud thought was part of the dream's formation to start with, and, and the actual content imagery of the dream. Freud says this, he said, given that reversal of, of physical location, this suggests the possibility that other operations of a reversal mechanism of disguise is operating in this dream. So let's see if we can look at other features of the dream and reverse them in order to decode what the dream might be about. So he said, well, the in, the, in the dream, what's happening is the child is being looked at and stared at by the wolves. He's lying there passively, and the wolves are looking in and looking in and looking in. But Freud's looking for something that happened in this child's life that is hidden and reversed in the dream imagery. So he said, maybe, and he doesn't just say maybe, he says, let's just assume that this was a scene, something happened in this little boy's life where he was looking at something. He opened his eyes and he saw something. So he's the one doing the looking. This is reversed and disguised in the dream by the wolves looking at him, but he's the one looking at it. So we're f forming a hypothesis about what it is that happened in the boy's life. It's a moment where the boy suddenly saw something and stared at it, was staring intently at something. What was it that he was seeing? Freud goes on to other features of the dream. He said, well, the, uh, in the dream, the scene is one of complete motionlessness. The wolves are as if frozen. They're not frozen because they're ready to pounce, but there's no motion at all. Everything is like a stillness. That's a reverse stillness, violent motion. So this child was looking at something, watching something happening, involving a whole lot of violent motion. What could it have been? But it's, it's disguised as its opposite. That's Freudian dream theory for you. Dreams need to disguise the truth. I don't, phenomenologist doesn't, says some dreams do that. Most of them don't, they express the truth. Thirdly, uh, the dream is complete silence. There might have been a lot of noise. So then Freud goes back to the original dream. He's, what he's trying to do is reconstruct out of a pure logical kind of argument of what it is that happened to this child that we could understand to produce this castration anxiety that then is symbolized in the dream of the wolves. And he said, well, maybe, maybe it's this to the reader. The child woke up one morning, the, the, the idea of one, one morning, this actually happened historically in this child's life, at age one and a half or two. He opened his eyes. The opening of his eyelids is symbolized by the uh, opening of the blinds, you know, or, or the opening of the curtains on the, on the windows, and the windows are open and looking out. So it's a moment in which the child woke up, and uh, he saw something happening. He looked, he looked across the room, and there was something happening, and it involved a lot of violent motion, and it was real noisy. Okay, and he was staring at it and staring at it and looking at it. And we know one more thing about it. It caused him to be afraid his penis was going to get chopped off. What could it have been that he saw? Then Freud brings in one other ingredient into, into the interpretation. This, if it's a stretch in your mind, it stretches my mind. It's okay, guys. Just flow with me, though. Freud doesn't give the evidence for this, but he just says that it's true that he knew this patient so well by this time that he knew that in his early life he was sexually very attached to his father, that the patient was suffering from what was sometimes called an inverse Oedipus complex. He wanted to be the exclusive romantic sexual love object of his father's attention. Normally a little boy has that for his mother, but in this case it was for the father instead. So that's another given in Freud's argument, another element there. This boy was tremendously interested in being, not that he understood exactly what would be involved in this, but that uh, this, this is what he wanted, to be his father's one true love in, in, in whatever way there can be for that to be expressed. So he wakes up in the morning, this little boy who's in love with his father and wants his father more than anything. He sees something with violent motion, a lot of noise, 
He's staring and staring and staring at it. It scares the hell out of him that he's going to lose his penis as a result of what he's seeing. What could it be? For it's the only one thing it could be. Only one thing. What is it? He saw his parents engaged in sexual intercourse, probably performed from behind, okay, doggy style, so to speak, okay? He calls it ah, tergo. He uses Latin. Freud kills me. What does he just say? Dog style. No, he says ah, tergo. You know what I mean? Anyway, because, because, um, and the, the, the father was like making love with his wife, you know, just going at it like mad is what it is, making a lot of noise and grunting and moaning and wham, 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 right? Here we are. But he saw it in a way that, that created an alarm that he was going to be castrated. What could it be? Freud said, well, he must have caught a view. This is why it had to be from behind. He must have caught a view of his mother's genitals and seen that she didn't have a penis. Maybe he hadn't seen that before. He's only one and a half or two. And what is it, when he sees his mother who doesn't have a penis, what? This, this, this woman has got no penis? And yet she's the one who's got all of my dad in every way, inside and out now. And he's all, look at all this taking place. And what's, you know, what, what, is, what is a child to make out of that? And you might say, well, that's crazy and preposterous. Well, let me give you a little bit of a tangent on that. You know, Freud says things that sound crazy and preposterous, but he's, he's, he's just never flatly wrong. He's always got his finger on something good. And, you know, why does a child assume when there's an absence of a penis that it's been chopped off? This is, this is what he thought that pa the, pa the patient as a little boy decided. Well, his mother must have had her penis removed. Mm -hmm. This is going to cost me to be my father's love object. It's gonna, I'm going to get my penis chopped off, too. That's the idea there. But... Uh, you know, women women are generally assumed, if, if a man sees a woman without a penis, as a little, as a little boy sees a girl without a penis, he thinks her penis has been chopped off. And a little girl discovers she has a, doesn't have a penis, and a little boys do, she assumes it's been taken from her. This sounds like baloney, doesn't it? It's a sort of anti-feminist baloney Freud. I was interested in these kinds of Freudian themes when I had my own children. And my daughter Rebecca was three years old, and one day I discovered she discovered the existence of penises. You know, I remember I was there when it happened. Yeah. And um, you know, I'm very modest and all. I didn't walk around with any clothes on or anything like that. I'm not going to do that. So she she hadn't really had an occasion to see that boys have penises. You know, but one day with three, maybe two and a half even, we're sitting on the front porch, little cute Rebecca, and little Elliot, who's a year older than she, was playing in the sprinkler naked. He's running back and forth in the water, and his little penis is going like this. <laughs> Her eyes are just like glued. <laughs> Whoa, what's that? What's that? And I didn't say anything. I was laughing to myself. I, you know, I didn't say, by the way, that's a penis, and the girls are fancy on the inside, and little boys are fancy on the outside. I didn't bullshit on that. <laughs> just, okay. Kind of just like, let it go, but I was really curious what it would be. And about four days later, you'd never guess the thing that happened was amazing. It kind of confirms Freudian kind of thinking. Uh, she came to me and she said, Dad, I just discovered something. And I said, what is that, my dear? She'd been reading a book about the origin of the universe, and God did this, and God did that. We give her all kind of books on every kind of topic in the world, including stuff I didn't even believe, like God created the universe. I don't know. Who, who knows what created it? But anyway, um, she said, I, I, know, I know what happened. I said, what is that, Rebecca? She's three, or at the most three, maybe not quite. She said, well, what happened is, in the beginning, God burned off girls' penises. He burned them off. This thing had been full of fire and all of this. That, that was the only explanation she could have. She created spontaneously a myth of female castration. That's what Freud says little girls do. So you, that's why when you read Freud, don't just dismiss it. You know, Just keep your mind a little bit open, but don't buy it all either. What he's saying is this little boy, when he saw his mother's genital organs, Freud's constructing it as a hypothesis, assumed that since she had no penis, it must have been chopped off. I happen to remember, by the way, when I saw my little sister's genital anatomy, I, you know, I was five and she was two, or I was four and she was one. I, maybe more like four and one. I happen to remember that day, actually. I didn't assume that she had been castrated, but she was having her diaper changed by my mother, and I remember I was standing and looking at this and, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> and then I felt this heartbreaking sympathy and empathy for my poor sister. She's got a birth defect. She's got no penis. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Jesus, she had to live forever with no penis. <laughs> I don't think it had been chopped off or burned off. You know? But something was terribly wrong. That's the concreteness. 
the anatomical concreteness of early childhood, isn't it? That, so Freud, is, that's what he's talking about. He's saying that comes into play in the Wolfman. So he has no proof that this even happened. He woke up to the primal scene. By the way, Freudians call this the primal scene. The view or the image from the point of view of the young child, of the parents in sexual interaction with each other. That's called, it. if you run into that phrase, primal scene, that's what it means. Anyway, so his idea was this little kid who was really, really fixated on his father, wanted his father's love above all things. It was a little bit of a reversal of what ordinarily occurs. Suddenly saw his parents in sexual interaction, saw his mother was castrated, thought that's the price of having daddy's love, is you must submit to castration. And when he saw that, in view of the unbearable wish that he be his father's great love, his own castration anxiety skyrocketed. That's Freud's theory. And then the whole thing became completely unbearable and was repressed out of the, out of the child's mind. And all that was left then was the dream. It was kind of like a blinking, like a red light blinking a little bit. What, that's a little piece of the trauma is there. Highly disguised, heavily reversed. You'd never guess what it was really about. The manifest content conceals the latent content. And here's where Freud finally makes an interpretation of the veil symptom that the patient had. That the veil, remember the, the symptom the guy gave him from the beginning was that there was an invisible veil separating him from the world. Freud suggests this, that the veil was like an actual, it's a remnant of that trauma. There was an actual veil over his bassinet that was transparent though. And when he woke up, he looked through that veil and saw the parents having sexual relations with each other. And that's what it was. I don't see it that way, obviously. But that, that's what Freud said. Now let me tell you the next part of the story. It's pretty interesting and amazing what happened. So Freud put all this together, used this tortured logic to generate this interpretation, and then sprang it upon the Wolfman. He said, Wolfman, I figured out what your dream is, and you need to take into account and, take, and accept and, and remember and, 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 and own uh, the following uh, understandings. And then he explained to the Wolfman what had happened, that he'd woken up, he'd seen the parents and did all this. What was the Wolfman's response? Dr. Sigmund Freud, B.S. I don't accept one part of what you're saying. I have no memory of anything like that. I don't think I woke up seeing my parents having any sexual relations or any other kind of relations, especially with each other. And it's just not true. I don't agree with that. So Freud tells us the patient resisted this interpretation, but Freud knew it was right. Here's the problem. Freud knew it was right. And Freud assumed that the patient's resistance was because it was so painful. For the patient to accept that it was true would mean he'd have to remember that moment and then feel the castration anxiety shooting through him and find some other way of dealing with it. But he's, he, Freud thought the patient was fighting it, fighting it, fighting it. The patient was saying, no, Freud, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. They went back and forth, around and around in arguments <coughs> with each other. Freud recounts these arguments in, in his uh, essay about it. And Freud finally, speaking to the reader, says, reader, let me tell you what happened. I finally was almost despairing because I couldn't get this patient to accept what plainly I thought was the truth. I needed to push him through his resistance. Otherwise, the whole analysis would come to grief. And so I finally resorted to a desperate measure. And here's what Freud did. He said to the patient, Wolfman, he didn't call him Wolfman at the time, whatever his name was, you and I are coming to the end of our relationship. I will see you for the next eight weeks. But at the end of that time, our analysis is terminated. Between now and then, for, the, for these next eight weeks, we will continue our work as usual. But after that, it will irrevocably cease. And Freud really meant business and convinced the patient he meant business, okay? So he produced an artificial termination on the relationship. And Freud said once he did that, the Wolfman's resistance melted. Suddenly the Wolfman said, he came in the next time and said, I was thinking further on this, Freud, and I think maybe you are right. Maybe there's something to this after all, okay? And yeah, I can kind of almost remember it now. And yeah, yeah, castration, yeah, yeah. And so the patient just kind of melted and collapsed and stopped resisting and kind of gave Freud the word, Freud's, Freud was looking, Freud the words that he was looking for, signaling the assent as to the correctness of the interpretation. And Freud followed through and terminated the analysis after the eight weeks was over. And then he writes up the case study as if it were a great success. Tremendous success. 
a breakthrough produced by a kind of an artificial <laughs> method of forcing the termination at the very end. But the patient just needed a kick in the ass, basically, to be pushed through to face the resistance he had. So it's a very unsatisfying story, just all by itself. But there's a sequel to it that it makes it really interesting to me, and to me also highlights the great destructiveness of the story I just told you of what Freud had imposed upon this patient. The patient, within a few months, left Austria and immigrated to England. And he had continuing psychological difficulties in England and came under the treatment of one of Freud's former students, a woman by the name of Ruth Mac Brunswick. Her name doesn't matter, don't worry about it. But then she wrote up a further case history on this patient so we can follow what Freud did with the patient as the story he tells and then see what happened to him in England. And what happened in England, among other things, was the patient fell into a paranoid delusion. The delusion being that someone had drilled a hole in his nose. The patient came to the belief, compellingly valid to him, that there was a hole right through the center of his nose. And uh, no one else could see the hole. He'd walk around with a mirror looking at it all the time, being afraid it was expanding and expanding and expanding. But no, he had a prize-winning nose. He was the best nose in the universe from the rest of the world's standpoint. But from his own, there was a hole right through the middle that was growing and growing, or threatening to, at least. This was the primary symptom that was generated. Associated with the symptom was the idea that there was some doctor not named, some physician that he had seen, this patient, who had produced that hole. And the patient thought about going and finding that physician and murdering him, shooting him. He wanted to strike back and kill the person who had produced this terrible violence into his prize-winning, otherwise prize-winning nose, okay? So uh, I was very interested then to read Ruth Mac Brunswick's essay about the patient to see what she said about that symptom of the hole in the nose. And I was astounded to see her initial conclusion. She said, the hole in the nose symptom, the delusion of the hole in the nose, proves Freud's genius. I said, what? Bruce is genius. How does it do that? Because what more transparent picture could there be of castration than, the, than, a, than a physical anatomical injury to the nose? Because the nose is another phallic symbol. It's like a tail and a wolf. Anytime in Freudian dream theory you have a nose, the nose is a male genital organ. So it's, it's symbolic of castration. So it shows Freud's genius that this man was dreaming, or having a delusion now, about the, uh, about the very theme and issue that Freud had made the centerpiece of his analysis in the first place. Whatever you think of that, it doesn't make any sense. Like, if, even if you accept what she says, that it is a castration theme, and I'm ready to think about that and accept that tentatively at least, if the patient was cured by Freud, he shouldn't be having this dream now. The thing should recede, and there should be out dreams about other things. So if, if she's right, it shows that the whole original problem is still there, uh, all stirred up and radiating into dreams. And so it, it really doesn't make any sense. And I, what I have to tell you now is my overall understanding of the thing. Now, what, what, historically, what happened in, in the case study going with, with Brunswick is that after a few months, maybe a couple of years, I don't know how much time it would be, that delusion of the hole in the nose itself receded, and the wolfman pretty much managed to recover. But she doesn't explain how or why that happened, just that it did. But still in all, it seems to me that if, if a patient undergoes therapy with Sigmund Freud, and he says that uh, the patient was cured by his artful psychoanalytic interpretations, it doesn't fit with that that the patient would become psychotic shortly thereafter. Don't you think there's a fly in the ointment here? Like something went wrong, wouldn't you say? So the question is, what is it that went wrong? And this is the part of the story I have to tell you that's a little bit subtle, and I hope I can make it clear. I think Freud was wrong about what he said, but yet oddly, paradoxically right at the same time. And it goes like this. Um, I'll just say it in different words, and, and several times, and maybe the, those words will converge into something. I think Freud castrated this man, metaphorically speaking, by forcing him to accept the truth of the interpretation that he had arrived at about his dream. Remember, he arrived at the interpretation, insisted the patient accept it. The patient refused. Freud terminated the patient in order to induce him to accept it. The patient did accept it then. I put myself in the 
frame of mind of the patient. This is a man who was a complete loser. He didn't have any family or friends. He had nothing, no one and nothing really to live for. His claim to fame was his relationship with Sigmund Freud, really. He's been given a choice. He can end the 